life is camping, heaven is home. In fact, that's what the Apostle Paul and Peter both said. They said that this earthly house, this tent we live in, is going to be taken down. It's a great way to think about. Uh, now we go to the next church. The third church is Pergamum. Uh, this, by the way, I already showed you yesterday that theater right there, that huge theater. I showed you the seat of Satan right there under those trees. That was the altar to Zeus. It was just a big statue of Zeus with his arms out. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But the lesson, maybe that's why I want to cover these nine slides. This, for our generation, is so important. Beware of the power of unforsaken secret sins. Now, we already know from Hebrews chapter 12, we should lay aside the sins which so easily beset us. So all of us have a certain flavor of sin that's our besetting sin. For some of you, you have the secret desire to, to look a certain way. And so it involves what you look like or what you wear, your shoes, your clothes. For others, it's kind of like to show strength, and so you're into the whatever, you know, the muscle thing or the muscle car thing. For some people, it's money. For some people, it's academics. You know, I mean, we have these secret ways Satan besets us with either pride or with lust or whatever. The Pergamites are an example of how serious that is to God. So here's the, let's look at the church starting in chapter 2, verse 12. To the angel, remember, Angeloi is the messenger. Uh, it doesn't mean a winged angel like I said my wife is. It, it was the local church pastor. He was the messenger. And boy, does that impact you when you're a pastor. I realized that the nominating committee and the elders didn't pick me. God picked me, and that church hired me, but the Lord is the one I work for, and I'm supposed to be his messenger teaching his word. And it was a transforming thing, and I loved the ministry. The church of Pergamos right. These things says he who has the sharp sword with two edges, speaking of Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. So Jesus portrays himself as being the one with the, the word of God coming out of his mouth. I told you all the letters have the same pattern. I know your works, so he's commending them. I know where you live. The Lord knows our address. He knows our cell phone number. He knows our DNA. He knows all about us. Look at this. Where you live is where Satan's seed is. Okay, that could just be that Zeus altar. So that's interesting. And thou holdest fast my name, and you have not denied my faith, even in those days where Antipas was my faithful martyr. See, this persecution that Nero started, that Domitian ramped up, hit their church too. Not only did the pastor at Smyrna, the last church, but now here, Antipas was my faithful martyr. By the way, do you know what church history says they did to him? They took a big bull god. You know, they worshipped uh, fertility gods, and, and bulls were a picture of that. And it was hollow, made of brass. And they, they put Antipas in that and shut the door of this hollow idol and built a fire under it and baked him alive. Uh, what a way to go to heaven. Who was slain among you? But look at the next part of verse 13. Where Satan dwells. Okay, we'll come back to that. Next, I have a few things against him, uh, thee. Because thou hast there, in that church, them. Now, I, I don't teach Hebrews, but you know how I understand the book of Hebrews? It's, it's the simple. I'm very simple. Uh, in Hebrews, there are 303 verses for my Greek comprehensive graduating seminary. When I went to school, this is how you had to graduate seminary. They took a Greek New Testament and set it down on a table in front of you. And they told you a chapter and a verse, and you had to pick it up, translate, and explain any passage in Greek that they put in front of you. That was called a Greek comprehensive. Well, I was in seminary for eight years. Or, well, for five years. I was in, in Bible school a total of eight years. But... The last five years, I was in seminary, and I knew I would never pass the Greek comprehensive. I took five years of Greek. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't open and translate any verse. I mean, I memorized the book, you know, blah, blah, blah. I did all that. So I went to the 80-year-old dean of the seminary. And I said, Dr. Neal, you know I can't pass the Greek comprehensive, and I know I can't pass the Greek comprehensive. Can you narrow it down to one book? And he went, <laughs> He said, yeah, I know you couldn't pass it. He said, when you have it put in front of you, I'm going to put the book of Hebrews in front of you. 
That's what I'm going to tell the faculty to quiz you on. Boy, I went home that night. There are 303 verses. I started memorizing them as fast as I could. I paced in my dormitory room, and I memorized all 303 verses of the book of Hebrews. And to make a long story short, when they put the Bible in front of me, they asked me for something from Hebrews, and I passed the exam just like that because I already knew what it said because I'd memorized it, and the Greek text quite closely follows uh, the English translation. Of course, Dr. Neal went, <laughs> at the end, he said, your translation of Greek is Elizabethan. What he was saying is, I know that you had it memorized. But as I was doing Hebrews, do you know what I picked up? All the way through Hebrews, there's the us and the them. And he says, we are not of those who do this and that, but we, but they, now remember Hebrews 6? It says, those who have once enlightened, those who have tasted the heavenly gift, and those who have... Do you see how the writer of Hebrews is not saying they're part of us? It's those, them. We, us, them. All of those passages make total sense when you see he's talking about a group of people he didn't even consider to be Christians. They weren't the us's and the we's. They were the them's. And so you see the same thing here. Look at how it comes out. Thou, you, have them. It's an us and them thing. And them hold the doctrine of Balaam. They are following what Balak said, to cast a stumbling block, to eat things sacrificed to idols, to commit fornication. That does not sound like Christian conduct to me. It's them. Thus you have those, same thing, the third person, that group, who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. Nikelao. Nike. You know, like, well, these aren't. But you know, Nike, shoes, victory. Laos, the people, the, the, the wide group of people, those who hold the victory over and control the people. What is that? It became, in church history, the, the great clergy-laity divide. Laity. There's a word, laity. It comes from laetans. And in the Catholic Church, the laity are all the, the little people, and the hierarchy are the rulers of the little people. And God said, I hate that. Now, God loves elders. God loves pastors. What's the difference between the Nikelao, Roman Catholic hierarchy of Pope and cardinals and bishops, and I don't even know all the levels, that hold supreme sway and they're the only way to God and you've got to come through them to God? What's the difference between that and the New Testament church? Well, it says in 1 Peter 5 that all elders are supposed to put on the apron. That's what Peter said, 1 Peter 5. The elders are to clothe themselves. Actually, the Greek word is eg combo. It's to tie on the the apron that a servant wore, a slave. And it says that elders are supposed to be the humblest, loving followers of Christ of the congregation, that people don't follow their position or their expertise. Did you know in leadership there are three levels? There's the level of a position, you know, you've got the manager position. Then you've got the expertise, you know more than everybody else. Do you know what really leadership is? Character. The strongest form of leadership is not the position or the expertise, it's the character. People follow people they see are genuine, real, compassionate, caring. You've you got to know something to have the expertise, but that's not the primary, it's the character. And so these Nicolaitans didn't have the character, they just had the position. God said, I hate that. Which thing I hate? Repent. Remember, it's always the solution. Or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them. Them, those, them. It's these people that were masquerading in the church. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now he's talking. He said, believers have ears. Believers hear. Believers respond to the Word of God. My sheep hear my voice. They know me. They follow me. To him that overcomes. The people that hear are overcomers. This is called the perseverance of the saints. No one that believes ever stops believing. Now, we doubt. We struggle. We, we go through trials. But we never let go because it's not how hard I hold on to the Lord. It's that He, what, is holding me. And that's what John 10. Jesus said, You are in my Father's hand and Actually, you're in my hand, and my Father holds me. So you're doubly secure. Uh, So to overcomers, to believers, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. 
I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. And let's go through what all that means real quickly. Uh, beware of not resisting sin. These people had these, these terrible temptations around them. It says in verse 12, look at verse 12. Um, I, uh, I have the two-edged sword, the angel of the church of Pergamos. Jesus knows our spiritual life. That's why he says, I have the sword. I have these piercing eyes. Uh, he's, he's tracking our good works. Verse 13, um, I know your works. I know everything you do for me. I know why you do it. Uh, in um, Basically, how I see Pergamos is, if you remember what happened in Japan uh, five, six, seven, eight years ago, remember Fukushima, the reactor that overheated and, and they had to evacuate the whole coast of Japan and all the radiation went out. Did you know that even to this day it's like a death zone, that there's so much radiation? Going into contaminated areas is what reminds me of this. Our spiritual immunity, because see everybody in Fukushima started dying because their immunity got shot by all that radiation, is compromised when we as believers, as God's own people, are willing to go to toxic, horribly contaminated sites with no protective gear on. You see, when we're walking in the Spirit, we wear the armor, we wear the helmet, we have the shield, we have the sword, we have our feet protected, we have the breastplate on. We don't want unfettered, unfiltered exposure to sin. We're uncomfortable around sin. The Pergamites weren't. They were comfortable around what God hates. And especially this. It says in verse 13, and that's a close-up of where the altar of Zeus was right there. Satan was there. You say, what, what do you mean Satan was there? Well, did you know only God as Father, Son, and Spirit is omnipresent? Satan and the demons are not. Did you know Satan is only in one place at a time? Right now, he's not everywhere. Do you ever hear of people that blame Satan for everything they do? Oh, Satan, the devil made me do it. No, he didn't. He's only in one place at a time. And there are only so many demons. And they're not everywhere all the time. They're not omnipresent. God is. Angels and demons aren't. But Satan is somewhere all the time. And if he's not up accusing us, and he still gets to do that until Revelation 12, we'll find out, Satan actually comes before the throne of God and says, have you been keeping an eye on? And he points us out. He knows us by name. And he accuses us before God. So Satan sometimes is up there. But at this point in chapter 13, Satan's headquarters was Pergamos. And so all the demons were coming and going from there, and he was running his conspiracy globally to shut down the little Christ invasion from there. Because of that, the people were afraid. And fear can surround us. That's why God says, I know you're surrounded by fear, but don't fear. You don't have to give in to fear. And verse 14, look at this. I have a few things against you because you have there those. You are tolerating, you are permitting, you are comfortable around things I hate. Always think of sin as contagious. When I was your age, I had collegiate friends, buddies, and I started noticing some of them just kept being on the line and they kept crossing the line. They kept saying, yeah, I know the rules here, but you know, nobody knows or nobody will find out. And they just kept crossing the line. And you know what? Slowly, after a first and second admonition to them, I slowly no longer was friends with people that said they were Christians, but were willing to go against what God says and submit to the authorities that were over them. Why? Sin is contagious. If you get comfortable around someone that breaks God's law and is not submissive, you will get tempted to be like that. But the good news is no matter how far uh, we get, it's always one step back to Jesus. That's why I look at verse 16, repent. And we're right back, right back, just like the moment we were saved, as close as possible. And look what he offers in verse 17. I will give some of the hidden manna to you to eat. 
You know, the Lord calls the Bible hidden manna. Uh, in Isaiah, see, this is so connected. Uh, Isaiah, I think it's 32. Um, no, it's Isaiah 33. Listen to this. Uh, verse 14, who among us will dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with the everlasting burnings? That's how God describes himself, intensely holy. He who walks in righteousness and speaks uprightly, verse 15. He who despises the gain of oppression, who gestures with his hands, refusing bribes. He stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed. He shuts his eyes from seeing evil. Remember we talked about that last hour? He will dwell on high. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given him, verse 16, and his water will be sure. What the Lord says is, to those who say no to sin, not that we never sin, we hate it. Not that we never are around sin, we aren't comfortable around it. We want God more than that. He offers us this hidden man experiencing God daily. And so that is when the church almost went extinct. Now, here we go. Question. Class 7. Did you know some people are going to get to heaven empty-handed? How do I know that? Here's a verse. If you don't have it marked in your Bible, you should. I, I, there are a few verses I tell people everyone should know. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 10. It says this. According to the grace of God, all that we do is only by His grace, which was given to me as a wise master builder. I've laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds. So he's talking to us. He's saying, be careful what you do with your life. Life is like you know, building Legos or whatever you built, you know, Lincoln Logs, uh, when you were little. It's like a building project. Uh, no other foundation can anyone lay that's laid. So Jesus is the foundation we build on. If anyone builds on this foundation, it can be gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Everyone's work, verse 13, will become clear. The day will declare it. That's when we're in front of Christ. It will be revealed by fire. Now look at verse 13. And the fire will test everyone's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work, verse 14, which he builds on endures, he'll receive a reward. So he's, he's not going to be empty-handed. But look at the next verse, verse 15. If anyone's work is burned... He will suffer. What's the next word? Someone read it. What's the next word in, in verse 16? Loss. He will suffer loss. Wow. He himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Bonnie and I, when we pastored in New England, bought a home in Massachusetts, and after we left, it was a housing downturn, and you couldn't sell stuff in the 80s, and so we rented it. And it was a nice house, and we rented it. And it was built in 1898. It was old as the hills and very, it was not even, didn't even have a real foundation. It was built on rocks. It was all we could afford. Well, one day, one of the renters we rented to was smoking in bed, and they missed the ashtray, and they fell asleep, and their cigarette was down on their covers, and it started on fire, and they burned our whole house down. It was horrible. They went to the hospital. Smoke inhalation, they got burns. But when we went back, it was pathetic to see what was left of that house after it burned. I mean, the refrigerator, the plastic on it shriveled, the, the whole television shriveled down. The, the parts that they sprayed with water, we could see, the rest burned. And this, this verse, saved so as by fire, is not positive. They saved parts of our house, but after the fire and the smoke and all the water sprayed on it, it was just worthless. What it says is, some people are going to get to heaven, and they're going to bring their cart up of everything they did in their life that wasn't sin. All the sins are taken out of our cart of our life, and they dump it in the river of fire. Jesus is on the other side, and when he receives the product of their life out of the fire, all they did burned up. Look what the verse says. It will be tried by fire, verse 16, uh, or verse 15. Everyone's work is burned. He'll suffer loss, but he'll be saved yet so as through fire. The people whose whole life wasn't lived according to God's plan 
end up empty-handed. Okay? So who was getting this message? Well, we've seen Ephesus left their first love. Smyrna were in trouble fearing. Pergamus and Thyatira were getting comfortable around sin. Sardis. This church is getting a real serious warning. This is the warning. To the angel, I mean, sorry, Thyatira. They're getting a serious warning. These things, says the Son of God, whose eyes are like a flame of fire. That means he sees everything. His feet are like fine brass. That means he corrects things. He doesn't allow tolerate sin. I know your works, your love, your service, your faith, your patience. As for your works, they're more than the, the last and more than the first. What? By the way, this is the longest letter of all of them. Thyatira gets more verbiage than the other church. And look at that, that pedigree. You're loving, you're serving, you're full of faith, you're full of patience. In fact, you're doing more now than you used to do. Wow. Number one, you can live an unashamed life. He said, I see your eyes with eyes of fire, and I have feet of brass. And he says, I'm watching. You know what that means? I can know he's watching and respond to it. So I hope your goal in life is to live the unashamed life. You say, what do you mean the unashamed life? Shame is bad. No, it's not bad. Shame is when we're aware of how we fall short of the glory of God. In our culture, shame is bad because you're not supposed to be aware anything you do is wrong. It's all okay. John said in 1 John 2, I don't want to be ashamed before you, Jesus, when you come. It was a motivator to the Apostle John who wrote how many books? Yeah, remember that's coming. Uh, he, he did not want to be ashamed before Christ that is coming. How do you do that? By living the unashamed life. By living like, it would be like living like a camera's on you all the time. Wasn't there a movie about that? This funny guy was always watched on TV and he kind of knew it. And, and that's what we live like, only it's not a funny guy, it's God watching us. Secondly, today you're either advancing or retreating. Look how Jesus said in verse 19, I know that what you're doing now is more than what you used to do. So we get to do a choice every day. Either we're doing more or less. And God is watching. This is the longest letter. And by the way, God sent more letters to this area than anywhere else. Twelve different epistles in our Bibles were, were sent to this area of what we would call Roman Asia then and modern day Turkey today. Revelation was sent there. Both of Peter's epistles were sent to Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. That's this geographic area. Paul's letter to the Galatians, that's the southern part of Turkey. Ephesians, that's western. Colossians, that's central. Plus, First and Second Timothy to Ephesus. Plus, John's three epistles. And that's where James sent his letter to the 12 tribes scattered throughout this area. It was amazing. Now, verse 20. After the great commendation, Jesus says in Revelation 2.20, I have a few things against you. You allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants, Christians, to commit sexual immorality. What is that? Acting like the world. They were going to the theaters and watching it. And you watch it long enough, you want to do it. And so... They were eating things sacrificed to idols. It's living like the world. After you were at the theater, you'd go to the temple of the gods and have this huge meal and drink, and, and things would get out of hand, and pretty soon you would be involved committing sexual immorality. And there was actually a woman leading a Bible study that said, hey, it's okay. You know, there's some people are so rigid. They're so narrow. It's okay to go to the theater. You're forgiven go. And if you want to go to the party afterward and get involved, God forgives. His grace is great. And they were doing it. Look at verse 21. Jesus says, I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality. She wasn't just teaching the class. She was leading the parade. She was involved. Must have been quite a Bible study to go to. You know what I mean? With a leader like that. Well, the question is, are you quenching God? You know what the worst thing a Christian can do? Quench the Spirit. The Greek word is sabeomai. It means if you have a fire, you dump a bucket on it of either sand or water or something, and you extinguish it. The Holy Spirit is like 
the flame burning within us, energizing us, lighting, empowering, uh, making us bold and, and full of joy. And this kind of behavior is like dousing that fire. Are you quenching God? Jesus knows who's influencing our lives, like that Jezebel. Whether they're challenging us to sanctification, which means more and more usefulness to God, or feeding our flesh, seducing us, committing eating, which is the wording from chapter 2, verse 20. And that grieves or quenches the Spirit of God. Uh, what did Peter say? Remember he wrote to the same area, 1 Peter 2. Let me get there. Uh, for, sorry, got my marker in here. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore lay aside all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, all envy, all evil speaking, as newborn babies desire the pure milk of the word, if indeed you've tasted the Lord is gracious. So to these Thyatirans, Peter had already told them, uh, uh, clean up your life, say no to all that stuff, stop going to those parties, stop getting influence, on and on. Now look at verse 9. Why? 1 Peter 2.9. Because you are a chosen generation, you are a royal priesthood, you are a holy nation, you are a special people to, so that you can proclaim the one who called you out of darkness. Now look at verse 11. Beloved, Peter says, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts that war against your soul. That's a great verse to memorize. Going off to somewhere else after here that's not as conducive for Christianity as word of life, like Michigan State where I went, that verse, just hear Peter saying with the voice of Christ, beloved believers, I beg you, live like an alien and a pilgrim, abstain from fleshly lusts. It wars against your soul. Our friends, the godly Christian surrounds himself, wherever they are, with people that challenge them to being useful to God. Now, sometimes it's very uncomfortable. I don't like my friends that say to me, what did you read in the Bible this morning? What verse are you meditating on? When's the last time you shared the gospel with someone? What are you praying about that God be at work in your life? I don't like that because it's... it's Unpleasant to be reminded sometimes of how we're not doing those things. That's what we should have, not people that feed our flesh. People that say, it's okay, no one will find out. Well, in Thyatira, sin was everywhere present, powerfully alluring. I've already covered that. Between the gymnasium and the theater and then all the entertainment, it was like living in a cesspool of sin. That's what one ancient Roman writer called the the Greco-Roman culture. They called it a cesspool. Do you know what that is? A septic tank. You know what the closest thing to it is? Have you ever heard of having colon surgery? Colon surgery, healing from it, is like taking your hand, gashing yourself to the bone, have it bleeding, and find the dirtiest diaper you can find from some child that's, you know, just fill that thing with, with everything that you fill diapers with, and stick your hand in there and wrap it around and try and heal the hand. That's what colon surgery is like. It's putting a cesspool around an open wound. That's what the Greek historians said the, the culture of the first century was like. Those people that came to Christ were trying to grow in their, their heart surgery. They have a new heart, a new spirit, and, and here's this growing process, and they're surrounded by a dirty diaper culture. And the Lord wants us uh, to live. So here's Christ's call to holiness. By the way, Paul has already written a letter to the Galatians. And the Galatian region is where Thyatira is. So they already got this letter 30 years ago. And in that letter, Paul tells what the secret of the Christian life is. It's right here. He gives his testimony. What's Paul's testimony? You all know Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. So in the past... Christ died, and I was crucified with him. But today I'm here. But the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the one who died for me. What is that? We live Christ-like in the present based on something that happened in the past. 
That's what, when we share the Gospel, we're telling people. When we come out and simply tell them that Jesus died on the cross, He took your place, all of your sins are on Him. If you'll just come to Him, if you'll call out to Him, if you'll reach out to Him, if you'll believe, if you'll ask Him to save you, He will. What are we telling them? Today, you can go to heaven and have your sins forgiven and have endless life if you'll believe in an event based on the past. How did I get saved? I trusted, believed, and clung to the truth. Jesus took my sins, stood in my place, bore my punishment. Did I see him there personally? You know my favorite salvation story? As I read the Bible through once, I read every time the gospel is presented. That's all I mark. When Jesus presented the gospel to Nicodemus, what story did he tell him about the serpent in the wilderness that Moses put up on the pole? Do you know anything about the children of Israel? How many of them came out of Egypt? Three million. 600,000 families. What were they living in? They were camping. So they all had their the husband, the wife, the kids, the cart, the, the donkeys, the ox, whatever, their tent, all that stuff. Did you know in a, in a normal New York campground how much room it would take to make campsites for 600,000 people by New York standards of how much room you need for your campsite? How much room? 81 square miles of New York would be needed to have a campsite far enough from the other campsites so that your cow didn't step on their tent. You know what I mean? 81, that's nine miles from top to bottom. Top to bottom, nine. Side to side, nine. Nine times nine is how much? 81 square miles. So when this serpent, see, Jesus said, Nicodemus, you don't have to You don't have to see the event to be saved. As the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, the Son of Man is going to be lifted up so that whoever believes should not perish but have everlasting life. Did the people that got bit by the serpent have to be dragged in front of the serpent in Moses' time in numbers to get saved? No. They were convulsing. They were being paralyzed. They were were blinded by the horrible serpent bite of those venomous serpents. What did the people do? They knelt next to them. They, they said, hey, Moses has put a serpent up. It's nine miles from here. You won't be able to see it. It's a long ways away. But if you just believe that that serpent is a symbol, whatever they told him, they were telling him, look at something you can't even see, and by faith you cling to it. Wow. I love that story. That means anyone anywhere in the world that by faith will look at an event 2,000 years ago, God will instantly transform them. Wow. Did I see Jesus personally die on the cross? No. It was by what? Faith. I believe the truth of God's Word about the past event and God changed me forever. The way we were saved, by the way, is the same way we live the Christian life. We live Christ-like today, resisting sin, based on an event in the past. And so, point number four, we're either floating. Look, look what it says in verse 20. Whoop, let me get to verse 20. Uh, I have a few things against you. Uh, She's calling herself a prophetess and you're following her seduction. Either you're floating along with whatever's going on or you're resisting it. Life is kind of like a canoe trip. Uh, When I grew up, our youth group always went on canoe trips. I'm sure they have them in New York. They have them everywhere. And basically, we'd all go to church early in the morning, get on the church bus, and they'd drive us to this point where we'd meet this, this trailer that had all the canoes, and they would issue us a canoe and throw in paddles and life jackets, and they'd let us into the river, and that same trailer and bus would go down to another point downstream and park. And they never, without fail, ever had to worry about us because, I mean, I never paddled on any of those trips. I threw my canoe in, my life jacket, and I was splashing everybody, ducking, tipping over their canoes. We, the, the river's only this thick, but what's going on? There's a current. And we were all keeping up with our little canoe because, you know, our drinks were in there and our backpack or whatever. But the, all day long, the canoe was following the current downstream. And so all those canoes get to where the trailer is. And we follow the canoe. That's life. We come in to life and Satan, the God of this world, the whole course of this world, everybody born is under his sway and they're all headed toward destruction floating down the river. And in my canoe one day, someone was standing in the path of my canoe. And they went, stop. 
and they had nail prints in their hands, and they looked at me and they said, you are a sinner, and I died in your place, and if you will allow me to, I will forgive and change you, and I'm going to actually turn your canoe around, and you're going to go through life going instead of to the broad gate, you're going to go to the narrow gate. You're going to go upstream. So you've got to get that paddle. That's what sanctification is. Resisting sin. Saying, I want to do what you want me to do. I want to go away from the course of this world toward you. Guess what? Every one of us, if you're a Christian, what I just described happened to you. And the Lord turned your canoe around the moment of your salvation, set you on a new direction, handed you your paddle, which is the Word of God, and the energy of the Holy Spirit is grace. And the first thing that happens is you're going upstream, you bump into someone you know, and they go, oh, you're going the wrong direction. We're all going that way. What's wrong with you? You don't come to the games. You don't come to the parties. You don't, you don't do what we do. And you go, Jesus changed me. He can change you. And they try and turn your canoe around. They try and discourage you from following Christ. See, either you're floating along with the world as a Christian. You know what a lot of Christians are doing? The Lord turned their canoe around, so they're kind of floating backward through life. They're in two worlds. They know they're displeasing the Lord, but their friends are doing it. And they just, they're sick. They feel empty. They feel anxious. They feel restless and hopeless. They're going the wrong way, and they just feel far from salvation. And sometimes they fear that they're going to, you know, lose their salvation and go to hell because they're floating the wrong way. That's what was going on in Tyra. Tyra, that's what Jesus talks about. Beware of sins against your own body. You know what Paul said. He said, all of their sins are different. Immorality, fornication, all sexual sins are different. All other sins, he said, are outside the body. Sexual sins in 1 Corinthians 6, 18-20 are against the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you're not your own. So basically, there are only... Whoop, back up. Samson got excited. Here we go. There are only healthy Christians and sick Christians. Healthy Christians are paddling against the current of the world. They love not the world or the things in the world. Sick Christians are floating and getting further and further away from the goal God has for them. Sick Christians are like Isaiah 57, 20. The wicked are like the restless sea. They're restless. They're, they're just, they're sick. Those that are healthy are like Isaiah 32, 17. The work of righteousness shall be peace and the effects of righteousness, quietness and assurance. There are these quiet, assured. Uh, 32, 48. Oh, that you had, I mean, uh, 48, 18. Oh, that you had hearkened unto me, then your peace would have been like the river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. So what happens if you're a sick Christian? You're like Samson. Samson's a hero of the faith. Samson makes it to heaven. Samson went empty-handed. He lost everything. And so did Lot. And so did Ananias and Sapphira. This challenge is especially important because we're all living in a world like Lot, Abraham's nephew. All the evil he saw around him vexed his righteous soul. That's how we know he was a Christian. Peter identifies Lot who did horrible things, was a Christian. If you're troubled by evil around, that's a a glaring sign of salvation. God delivered Lot, but because Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom, when when God turned Lot's canoe around, he he put the door of his, his tent facing the godless Sodomites. Wow. He's the quintessential example of being saved so as by fire. He he went to heaven. He lost everything. He lost his wife. He lost his daughters. He lost his other kids. He lost everything. He lost his reputation. We will give an account for what we do with our body, 2 Corinthians 5.10. We will forever be wearing. By the way, I'm going to cover this when we get to chapter 19. I can't wait. Remember chapter 19 on your chart has two divisions, 19, 1 to 10 is the saints in heaven in 19, 11 to 15, are, is the second coming of Christ. Do you know what 19, 1 through 10 is talking about? We're arro- arrayed in heaven by Jesus in these beautiful clothing that we wear when we come back with him. What does it say our clothing is? The righteous 
acts of the saints. We are forever going to be wearing our good works. They don't save us. The righteousness of Christ saves us. But we are making for ourselves a robe that's going to be a portrait. It's kind of what comes out of the fire. All that we did are good works in the name of Christ and for his glory by his grace is what Christ gives us to wear. We call it a crown in chapter 19, a revelation. It calls it a robe. Beware, you can go on sinning too long. Look at verse 21 of chapter 2. I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she didn't repent. You can go too long. What happens if a Christian floats too far, resists God too much, douses the Holy Spirit too many times and quenches him? grieves him. What happens? Hebrews 12, 5 and 6. There's something from Hebrews. This is a great chapter. Chapter 12, which already I talked about the besetting sin chapter. It's the chastening chapter. Chastening is how God trains us for righteousness. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, let me read it to you. You know, that's why I love Bonnie so much. You know, I teach. This is all we do all the time. We do, we do this kind of class for Word of Life, 11 weeks a year. And then we do other groups, not Word of Life, the other weeks of the year. And I always say, you know what it says, and Bonnie's usually sitting right over there, and she should be here tomorrow, you'll see her right over there somewhere. And she always says, honey, don't tell him you know. Read it to him. So in memory of Bonnie, she would have said that to me at lunch if I didn't do this. Let me read to you what Hebrews 12 says. And we've all forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Nor be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. And then it goes on to say, uh, if you are without, verse 8, chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Oh, I'm glad that's in the Bible. I would never say that because it's too dangerous to say. Do you know what God says? If you can go through life with your canoe floating the wrong way to the very end of life and the Lord never grabs your canoe and shakes it and says, stop it. You're not acting like one of my children. If you never have that happen, the Bible says, I'll just read it. If you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and you're not a son of God. That's a sobering verse. By the way, what is chastening? Chastening is something you feel. It's emotional anxiety or distress. You say, the Lord does that. That's when he's shaking your canoe. He's saying, you shouldn't be doing that. You should repent of that. You should forsake that. You shouldn't be doing that. What does it look like in Revelation? I mean, it's a little more blunt here. This Christian who was living in immorality in Thyatira, verse 22, I will cast her, Jesus said, into a sickbed. And those who are involved with her into great tribulation, I'm, I'm going to do this in, the, in a way that they still have time to repent. And if they don't, look at verse 23, I will kill them with death. You say, what? Christians? God kills Christians? You bet. You bet. I mean, I could show you a lot of passages, but here are two very clear ones. You know what Paul said about the Corinthians? When he was teaching about the Lord's Supper, you know what he said? Examine yourself, make sure you don't take part in communion until you've confessed and forsaken all sin. If you unworthily, that means with dirty hands and dirty heart, partake of the Lord's Supper, he said, I will do something to you. Let me read it to you. 1 Corinthians 11. Boy, this is a sobering passage. 1 Corinthians 11. Um, starting verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man so examine himself and let him eat of the bread and drink the cup. For whoever eats in an unworthy manner and drinks is not discerning the Lord's body. Verse 30. For this reason, many are weak and many are sick and 
Many sleep. Now, there are a couple of you I could point at you. You are actually sleeping right now in this class. I've been watching you. I'm not talking about that kind of sleep. They were dead. They were just like, I will kill. Th that, Revelation 2, it is an example of a believer who didn't repent, who didn't take the warning. They persisted in unrepentant sin. And what John calls it is a sin unto death. A sin unto death. Wow. Well, don't forget God's three-step recovery program. Look at verse 22. Uh, he says, unless they repent, God wants us to repent. So if you want to avoid emptiness, restlessness, and boredom, remember this. God is not mocked. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. It's called the consequence engine. Well, you say, where's the grace of God and all that? Let's talk about the grace of God. The grace of God, Titus 2 says, teaches us what I just taught you. It teaches us we must deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. Well, let's finish up the Thyatirans. Now to you I say in the rest of Thyatira, as many as not known the depths of Satan, you're not trafficking in all this sin, I'm going to give you all these promises. And then he says, if you're a Christian, you'll hear. Well, what is the Lord's plan? It's to overcome Satan's plan. Satan, it says in John 10, his program is kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to kill your spiritual life. He wants to destroy your joy. He wants to steal your fruitfulness and boldness. That's Satan's plan. How does he do it? By getting us to drift and go the wrong way and not respond to the Lord. What's God's amazing offer? Well, you see it right there. God has great plans for us. I'll give power over the nations. You'll rule with me. Uh, and, and I'll give you the morning star. That's God's plan. Hey, I still have, let me get to the last point. I have two minutes for this. Do you know what the byproduct is of living the life God wants us to live? We have incredible boldness. Not in ourselves. In the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us incredible boldness. Uh, Bonnie and I just spoke at a conference in Chiang Mai. I've mentioned it before. It was uh, several hundred medical missionaries. Two of them were from Myanmar. You know what, Myanmar, Burma. This is their report. They stood up there as they gave their report at this conference we were at. Bonnie and I were the spiritual mental health care providers. We discipled them, and I did the main sessions. I actually taught them what I'm teaching you. Uh, they all felt like they were in the BI. Um, but this couple, just 10 years older than you, most of you are in your 20s. They were just early, or most of you are in your late teens or early 20s. These were just like 31, 32. They had invested their lives in Myanmar. They had both gotten their medical training. She was a physician's assistant. He was an MD. They were serving in Myanmar, and they said, we went there because we wanted to go to the darkest spot on earth. I said, what is it? They said, 90% of all men in Myanmar over the age of 18 are addicted to opium. It's like the whole country, that's where they have all the heroin that's being sold here. They grow it there, you know, kind of there in Afghanistan and a few other places. They have had a civil war longer than any other spot on earth. They are still at war in a war that started in World War II at the end, and they're still fighting it over there, a civil war between the two factions. Over 60 years, they have more demon shrines in that country than any other place on earth. There are more Buddhist temples on top of the hilltops concentrated than any other spot in the world. So they have the demons, they have the killing and warfare, and they have the opium addiction. And she stood up there. The, the, the one that gave the report was the lady. And she said, when I was in school, you know, I went to the Mayo. I had all the degree. I went into medical profession. I was going to make a ton of money. And I realized that God wanted me to instead use my medical ability, look at this, to go to the darkest spot. And so I started examining, where do they most need Christ? And I thought, what would drive someone to do that? One thing, following Christ so much, you have boldness and the power of God. So my question to you is, some people are going to go to heaven empty-handed. Now you know how not to do that.